question. Do you, list, you, do you want to call the list out and, and tell us and we'll get that order straight? Oh, it's okay if you don't go in exact order. Okay. Um, so let's just have the first person come up and uh, stand by. The next voice you hear will be from Mission Control. Hi, everybody. Josh Byerly here inside Mission Control. We're looking forward to taking your questions. I've got astronaut Nicole Stott sitting here beside me. She has flown both on the space shuttle. I remember a couple of those missions. And, uh, and the, uh, she lived on board the space station as well. So she is uh, ready to answer your questions. So if we'll go ahead and get started with the first one, we'll, uh, we'll see if we can answer it. Hi, I'm Latrell. Hi, I'm Latrell. Louder. Hi, I'm Latrell. Hi, Latrell. <laughs> what does water look like in space? What does water look like in space? Yeah. I think that's the question. And, well, water kind of looks like water does on the ground, except for it takes a different shape. So if you were to, say, take your drink bag filled with water and squirt it out on the ground, it's just going to kind of squirt out and then drop, you know, drop to the ground. But in space, if you squirt it out, it's going to make this big ball of water that then will just float around unless you disrupt it and touch it, and it'll go into a whole bunch of littler balls of water. But one of the other neat things about water is, is that when it's in that big ball, you can kind of stick your arm or something else through it, and it'll just coat your arm uh, like a glove with the water, because that's uh, the reason is that surface tension and things like that just behave differently in zero gravity instead of in gravity like they do down here. So unless you shook it off your arm, it's going to stay there. But it still looks clear like water does here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see, do we have another question? Yes, we're ready. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Would you like to go back in space on the International Space Station? One answer, or one word, I guess. Yes, I would like to go back to space on the International Space Station. It is a really incredible place, and getting there and coming back is a, a really fun and uh, uh, impressive ride. And the time on Space Station is just so amazing. I mean, everything from the way you float and move around in space and looking out the window back at Earth or seeing other spacecraft and having that time with your crew up there and also the, the really neat kind of science and work that's going up there, I would love to go back to Space Station again. I don't think anybody's ever said no to that question. No, I, I would have to question their judgment <laughs> if they said no. <laughs> All right, who's next? So I think the question is, did I always want to be an astronaut? And I think I always thought that being an astronaut was a really cool thing. But it really wasn't until I think I was in college already when I started thinking about, well, maybe there's a possibility of actually being an astronaut. But I was lucky enough to grow up with a family where we spent a lot of time out at an airport. My dad liked to fly, and so I learned all about flying and knew I wanted to do something with flying. And in the end, after I was studying engineering at school, I thought, well, you know, what better place to fly than space? And that's what kind of got me really thinking about being an astronaut. And then I was really fortunate to get a job at Kennedy Space Center in Florida and working with the space shuttles and got to see even more and more about what being an astronaut would be like and it made me more and more interested in it and I had people that encouraged me to apply and I'm very thankful to them because quite honestly I pinch myself or I have Josh pinch me <laughs> every day to uh, remind me how lucky I am that I have this this very very cool job. Yeah, it's a good question. Hi, my name is Jeffrey. Hi, Jeffrey. Um, are you going? Hi. Are you going to the Mars mission? Am I going to the Mars mission? Well, I don't think so. I think if I fly again, it'll be back up to space station. But I think that Jeffrey, um, that you and probably some of those folks in your room with you uh, should start thinking really seriously about you know that whole kind of astronaut or science and technology kind of jobs and and perhaps maybe um, one of you or more of you in that room will be the ones going to, to Mars someday. I, I really, really hope that 
uh, that I can watch uh, my son, who's a fifth grader, have those kinds of opportunities, and um, the same for, for you guys as well. I think we do have that to look forward to, but unfortunately, I don't think I'll be the one riding, riding to Mars. <laughs> Is it comfortable in space? Is it comfortable in space? It is really, really comfortable in space. So imagine right now in your classroom that you were able to just kind of float up out of your chair and you didn't feel like the pressure of your legs or your bottom in your in your chair on the wooden seat or the metal seat right now and that you're just everything was just kind of offloaded and you were able to float. It makes it very, very comfortable. And and that's everything from just how you float and move around to sleeping at night in a sleeping bag that you just kind of float in and you know, there's no pressure points and your body just can completely relax while you're in, in space. And so it is very comfortable. What was it like on the Nemo 9? What was it like on Nemo 9? Well, you know, when, and it was really awesome, when uh, I had the chance to do that Nemo 9 mission, I hadn't flown in space yet. So uh, I talked to a lot of the people who, who had done the earlier Nemo missions before me, and several of them had flown in space before, and they said, to me that this this that I would find probably that this will be the closest thing that um, compares to flying or living and working on a space station and I remember doing that mission and we're in this habitat or this you know this um, I know it's almost like a, a submarine kind of mm -hmm. thing that sits on the bottom of the ocean and about the size of one of the modules on the space station and I remember being in there thinking just how incredible it was that we were in this place where you couldn't just walk out the door without having special equipment on and you had to think about what was going on with the systems and the stuff that make the place work all the time and um, how you operate differently and then after flying in space it, it just was it was exactly what those other people had said to me it was the perfect perfect place to learn about how to live and work in an environment that's not like we have in our houses where we can just walk outside and you know breathe the air and move freely we have to all the time think about um, working differently and keeping ourselves safe and wearing the equipment that you need to live and work in that kind of environment so it was really really cool and to be on the bottom of the ocean for three weeks um, being able to go out and dive from that habitat and experience the environment around there, it's, it's very comparable to me to that experience I had uh, being able to do a spacewalk on the space station and being able to experience that in a very different way, um, to see our Earth in a different way and to just appreciate it like that um, from, from a perspective that's very different than kind of that we have kind of moving across, um, you know, moving across the surface of Earth. Um, I highly recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Brian. Hi. Uh, in the future, will you guys ever make more special technology to pass Venus? Will we go past Venus? Is to that what you? Yeah, well, you know, right now we have technology that we don't have people on board the spacecraft that do that, but we have all kinds of robotic uh, missions that take us outside of low Earth orbit, take us, you know, past the moon, past Mars, and then in the other direction, outside, you know, into the solar system as well, where we're learning all kinds of things about the other planets in our solar system as well as outside of it. And so I think the, you know, the natural path with the technology will be just like we're looking at taking people to Mars someday, we'll be looking at going further and further out uh, away from our, you know, our kind of earthly um, place and exploring the, the solar system and the, and the universe even more with um, people on board as well. So, and that's one of the things that we're using the space station for right now. We're, we're in low Earth orbit, we're what? 200 and something miles yeah. uh, above the Earth, which doesn't really seem all that far, but just by being in that place, we can learn more and more about how our bodies behave in space and what we need to pay attention to there, and also about the technology like, you know, engines, rocket engines, and fuel, and um, food, and all those kinds of things that we'll need to go further and further away from Earth someday. Yeah. Thank you. 
<laughs> how you use the restroom in space. Well, you know, that's a really good question. And it's one of those things that is just, you know, it's kind of the same, and then it's very different to what we do here on Earth. And I consider those things to be part of it, you know, part of, part of what I consider the whole adventure of, of flying in space is that, you know, the uniqueness of it and kind of the, the fun side of it, the adventure side of it was that it's not going to be exactly like what we do down here on Earth. But um, in space, you have, um, we'll go the number one, number two route, and you have the capability to deal with both of those. And for number two, it's kind of like a camp potty, you know, where you um, um, use that to contain the solid waste, and then that gets uh, burnt up in the atmosphere someday in a, in a spacecraft that takes trash away from the space station. And for number one, it's um, basically a hose, uh, we call a urine hose, that uh, has a vacuum on it, and you just um, take advantage of that system. It contains the, the urine, and then one of the really neat things about what happens there is, like with the space station as a whole, where we want to be as independent uh, a spacecraft as possible, not relying on um, Earth resources all of the time to get us what we need, we recycle all of our um, all of our liquids and moisture on board station and do that in a way that allows us to generate new clean water and also water to use in our technical systems too. So really kind of a neat process that goes on on board. and. Uh, Hopefully that answers a little bit about <laughs> what it's like to go to the bathroom in space. If you guys want to see it and, and you go to YouTube, maybe your teacher can do this. It's a clean video, but go, uh, go to YouTube and type in Space Potty, and you'll see a video that we did with Mike Massimino, another astronaut here a few years ago. It's, it's the shuttle potty that you're going to see. It's not the space station potty, but uh, you'll get the idea, I guess. It's, yeah. a, it's a very descriptive video, so enjoy. It's all about the vacuum, just like <laughs> yeah. space. It's all about the vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> Who's next? Hi, my name is Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Um, are the missions really hard? Are the missions really hard? Well, you know, that's that that's kind of hard to answer, actually, because we, we do so much training before our missions to prepare us for what we know is going to happen when we're on board, all the science we're going to do, the maintenance tasks that we have to work on each day, the way we're going to exercise and eat when we're up there and that kind of thing. So that doesn't really seem hard when you're up there because you, you're kind of expecting it. So I think that the thing that's, that's kind of hard is there, there's two things, really. One is when something doesn't go like you expect, it and you need to work differently with the ground team and your crew members to make sure that you get those kinds of things all worked out. That's a little, a little bit difficult or challenging, but again, our training also kind of prepares us for dealing with those kinds of things. But I'd say probably the hardest thing about a long duration space flight especially is being away from your family. And uh, I think it'll be a great day when we have families living and working in space together and it's just kind of one of those places you go to work every day and um, but for me that was probably the hardest part was was being away from family <laughs> hi my name is Abigail hi Abigail I was wondering whenever you were in elementary school like us uh, like when you decided to be an astronaut and why Okay. Well, in elementary school, and it was actually, when was I? I was, what, seven years old, I think, when uh, we had the, the moon landing. And I remember watching the moon landing when I was seven and um, thinking, like I said before, thinking, wow, this is, this was really cool. How cool is it that, you know, that, that dot of light I look at in, in space at night, uh, that there's people up there. But I have to tell you, at that point, I, you know, maybe I wasn't smart enough to think it or, um, or whatever, but I, I really didn't think that it was something I could do, I, you know, for whatever reason. And um, like I said before, too, my, my dad liked building airplanes, and I spent a lot of time out at an airport where I saw what, you know, what flying was all about and, and that kind of thing. And that was really very interesting to me. 
and flying the first time and having that perspective just even from a little airplane seeing how cars look like you know matchbox cars and all that and that you get this different view on earth i think that's what kind of ultimately led me down the path of at least wanting to fly and ultimately thinking, wow, what better place to fly than space? And really thankful that I, I had a job at NASA where uh, I was working with some of the spacecraft before I ever even applied to be an astronaut and could see what that was all about and work with the people that put all of those, those uh, amazing vehicles together and then later have the opportunity to actually fly on them. And I'm going to mention this because I have my shirt on for today. My STS-128 um, mission patch is on this shirt. And today was, what, what is it, the fourth anniversary of the um, mission, the STS-128 mission, our first day in space. So this is my little memory of um, trying to help me re remember four years ago uh, that really cool first time flying in space. And I can tell you, I'm, I'm thankful for the pictures and video because uh, it's mm -hmm. nice to go back and see just, just how wonderful that was. And, you know, I've got all the feelings and everything inside me about it, my particular memories, but to be able to go back and look at yeah. At, at that is pretty cool too, and to still be in contact and friends with my crewmates is really neat as well. That's cool. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Aiden, and I have my question is, what does it feel like when you're blasting off into space? Way awesome is what it feels like, and uh, and you you know you think you've got yourself all prepared for what it's going to feel like, and. You know, I worked at uh, I worked at Kennedy Space Center for uh, a long a long time, maybe longer than some of you were, are alive yet. Um, and so I had the chance, uh, really, the good fortune to watch a number of uh, of shuttle launches mm -hmm. and other launches um, from Cape Canaveral and things. And so I always imagined what it would be like. And I of course talked to other people who had done it to see what it feel like. But let me just tell you that you have kind of this impression of what it's going to be, and it's this much more impressive than than you can ever imagine and it's just you know everything from the way it feels and sounds and what it's doing to your body and how you're shaking and woohooing as you're going and then just after that eight or so minutes this just kind of beauty beautiful just relaxing comfortable floating quiet um ride once you're in orbit and it is it is an incredible ride and those of us that saw it in person, you know, obviously I've never been in there, and Nicole has, but, it, it, but being at the Kennedy Space Center watching these things lift off wasn't like anything you can even, it's not like the movies, it's not like you see on TV, because yeah. you're about, what, four miles away, three or four miles away, and you see it before you hear it. So you see it go off, you see all the smoke and the vapor, and, and it's just a very bright light, and then all of a sudden you start to kind of hear this rumble, and then it just hits you like a wall. I mean, it is, imagine the loudest yeah. train, loudest airplane you've ever heard in your life and it just rattles you like crazy it's 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 amazing and then it's over with i get goosebumps thinking about yeah. it yeah <laughs> yeah it's a good question watching it or being on it yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. thank you hi i'm joe hi um, what is the purpose of the um, international space station good question Awesome question. What is the purpose of the International Space Station? Well, you know, um, I think that, you know, the purpose over time has evolved, but it's ultimately evolved to what the real purpose of the space station is. You know, we had tasks along the way while we were building the space station where we were really kind of proving out if we could even do this kind of thing, this very complex thing in space, not just as, you know, one country, but as 15 countries putting all different kinds of hardware together, and we very successfully met that mm -hmm. challenge, and uh, now we have this, just this magnificent facility that's uh, orbiting our Earth every day, and the, the purpose of the space station is for us to live and work up there and to do the research that's necessary or that we um, can in this very unique zero gravity environment that will help us learn more about how we can live better here on Earth, but also how we can further explore outside of uh, low Earth orbit. And it is just a magnificent place for doing this. It's, I, when I was up there, I think on a daily basis we had over 100 active investigations going they've got, on. Yeah, they've got 200 now. Yeah, and that's, and that's whether, you know, I mean, a crew member could be interfacing with it directly, you know, actually working the, the science experiment like you guys do, I'm sure, in some of your science classes in school, 
or um, helping the people on the ground work the, the experiment on board. And, and that's everything from learning more about our, our own bodies and learning about how fuels burn more efficiently, how materials are developed, how, I mean, every science area you can imagine is being investigated in some way on board the space station. And it's because it provides a very unique environment for looking at things and how they work in a way that we just can't do here on Earth. And so it gives us all kinds of new and interesting answers to things. That whole thing we talked about with the water. I mean, you look at water in space and what it does and how it sticks to your hands and how it, and then scientists start thinking about, well, in space we could use water or some other liquid in a very different way than we do here on Earth, perhaps to simplify the way we build rocket engines and lubricate things. Why have big ball, metal ball bearings mm -hmm. lubricating a system if you could have a liquid that does that because it behaves differently in space? or the way crystals grow. They grow perfectly in the zero-g environment and we can learn more and more things about how our bodies work and how medicines can be made or solving you know, just really cool problems because we have this, this, this laboratory in space to do that. And, and that ultimately is the purpose, this laboratory in space to help us live better here on Earth and figure out how to explore outside of Earth's atmosphere as well. Good question. Hi, my name's Jade, and how long does it take to, um, to be an astronaut? How long does it take to be an astronaut? Well, um, you know, you start in school, kind of right where you guys are right now, and a lot of it is, has to do with, you know, paying t attention to the stuff you enjoy doing. And for, for me, and I think for most people who are astronauts, or actually I think most, you know, we're in this mission control center here now too with the folks that, that support the astronauts that are on the space station. It was all about taking those interests that you have in science and math and, you know, engineering, and maybe not even knowing that it was an interest in science and engineering and math at that time, but um, paying attention to those things and letting that be what helps guide you through school and stuff. And, and for me, I think the flying thing was, was the big thing I was interested in. And so wanting to know how things fly, wanting to um, figure out how to build things that fly, and maybe then one day fly in them myself was the thing that motivated me. So um, there's a lot of kind of basic things you have to do in school to qualify to even interview as an astronaut, and that's, um, I think, very well documented on our website. You can go math on there. Math and science, really math and science, math yeah, and math science. Yeah, math and science, math and science. And it is fun. <laughs> And, uh, but there's, you know, there's really good information on the website about, you know, what it takes to apply. And a lot of that is just, you know, a degree in a math or science um, area of study and then working in that area for a while, a uh, couple years. I, I've seen people that have come straight out of their university work and um, been selected as astronauts, but it's really kind of a focused science mm -hmm. and math driven thing. But you got to enjoy what you're doing along the way, mm -hmm. and uh, that'll take you down those paths of, of engineering, math, science, if that's, if that's what you're all about. That's the, I think uh, that's what everybody always says, you got to go find something that you love to do. And you guys yeah. have plenty of time to do that, but you know, life is too short to have a boring job, so yeah. go, find, <laughs> go find something that you really like to do, and uh, it's interesting what happens to you whenever you do that. Yeah. So. Emma, and my question is, why does NASA trade off astronauts to go to the uh, space station area? Okay, so why does NASA trade off astronauts to go to the space station? So, so right now we have six crew members on board, and three of them are about to come home. September 10th. Then a couple weeks here. So um, we do that because. Um, first of all, we have um, spacecraft that have kind of a limited lifetime on board. And so, you know, they have, what is it, about seven months worth yeah. of time that, that they can stay up on the space station before the, the spaceship that you rode up on needs to come back. So that kind of drives the amount of time that the astronauts can stay up there, too. And so each of those spacecraft has a seat for three, and three of the people come down, and then three more people go up. And so, so there's that piece of it. But there's also the, um, the piece that says we want to rotate people through so we get uh, a different experience base up there. We have different people living and working in space and uh, that, that experience thing. And then we also have, um, you know, there's, there's 
things about the environment in space that uh, make us want to limit the amount of time we have people up there. So right now, with what we know about how our bodies uh, respond to space, whether that's you know the way our mu our muscles and our bones uh, react to being mm -hmm. in space, or our cardiac, you know, the way our heart and um, our other systems respond, we are managing that as well. And and six months really seems to be the kind of time that um, cycling uh, astronauts to the space station is best. Now, we do have some, uh, some astronauts that are going to be going up for a year. One whole year. And, um, and that will give us the opportunity to look, you know, a little bit differently at how, how crew members and, you know, and human beings will respond to that space environment. And because of what we've done with crew members prior to this, we feel very comfortable sending somebody there for a year and allowing them to experience that way. And then we'll just rotate our vehicles a little bit differently so that you're not going up and coming down on the same one. Yeah. I think that was our last question, I believe. So we want to thank you, our friends in there at McCorder Elementary. You're not very far away from us here. Yeah. Uh, at the Johnson Space Center, so we hope you guys come and say hi sometime and take a look at this uh, awesome room that we're sitting in right now. This is the Mission Control Center where they control everything on board the space station. So come by and, and take a look at it, and maybe you'll have one of these jobs one time, or maybe you'll be like uh, Nicole over here and actually fly into space a couple times. So thank you guys for joining us. Have a good day. Study hard, and uh, have a good semester. Thanks for the great questions. Bye.